Hello, everyone, and thank you very much for joining us wherever you are in the world. I'm Megan O'Donnell. I'm Assistant Director for Gender and a Senior Policy Analyst at the Center for Global Development. And I'll be facilitating today's discussion on approaching COVID-19 risk and response through a gender lens. As many of you are well aware, in addition to the grave health risks that this global pandemic is posing, uh, we've also seen it expose and in fact magnify pre-existing inequalities, whether those stem from income level and economic status or geographic location or what will be the focus of today's discussion, gender. I I'm very pleased to be joined by a fantastic group of researchers, practitioners, and advocates, uh, some of whom are closer to the front lines, working tirelessly already to try to fill in gaps and respond quickly to the risks that this crisis has posed. Um, others of us who are farther behind the scenes, working to generate and draw upon rigorous data and evidence to inform response efforts and, and hopefully increase and maximize their impact. Each of the speakers who will be addressing you today is going to unpack specific gendered dimensions of COVID-19, uh, drawing upon data of what we know currently about the problems and solutions that it poses, going backwards into the data and evidence that we know from other pandemics and other crisis contexts, and importantly, presenting their recommendations for how a gender lens should be integrated both into rapid response efforts and also longer term solutions to ensure that both are equitable and inclusive. Uh, then we'll have a chance for you to join in, share your thoughts, comments, and questions to engage in the conversation. Um, there'll be about a half an hour, we hope, towards the end, where if you want to tweet at us, at CGDev with the hashtag CGDTalks, or email us at events at cgdev.org, or just type your comments you know, into the comment question bubble on YouTube down below. Um, we'll have a team behind the scenes here at CGD tracking all of those, and we'll feed them to our speakers. So without further ado, we are gonna kick off uh, with our speakers' comments. I'm gonna start with Gary Barker, who is president and CEO of Promundo. Uh, to speak first to what is top of mind for many of us, of course, the, the health risks that COVID-19 poses. Gary, where sex disaggregated data is available, we're seeing that based on fatality rates, it seems like men are more likely to die of this disease than women. Can you, based on Promundo's work, put that into context for us, understanding not just the biological, but maybe some of the social drivers um, and how does this impact both individuals and households? Yeah, thanks, Megan. And first, I want to thank the Center for Global Development for doing this event. As we've watched this huge spike in gender-based violence, um, I think it's truly, truly called attention to how much gender matters. And particularly in a moment when so much science is being ignored by some of our leaders, I think bringing this data lens, and particularly the paper that you all worked on, I want to commend you for that. Um, so what's up with men and what's up with masculinities in this moment? First off, I want to say in talking about that and in looking at men's death rates, we need to put this in a lens of, mas of, of intersectionalities. It's not just male versus female. It's not a zero-sum game. We also want to look at as relational, what men's higher death rates mean for women, in particular around caregiving and other issues. So a few key points. One is that we don't know much. The Currently, the gender discussion of men's higher death rates is kind of simply disaggregating data and death rates by sex. That's a very crude measure, as we both, as we all know, in terms of gender. But let me go to a few things that we do know, and some of it come from what we know about other um, health issues affecting men and women in different ways. So the point, point one that's already been made is that men are dying at higher rates. Everywhere we have data so far, it's about twice um, about twice of the deaths have been men. It's, I have the numbers correct, at least the, the most recent ones you can find, 70% of deaths in Italy, 64% in China, about 60% in the U.S. New York being the epicenter in the U.S. is 59% of deaths. Or the, sorry, those hospitalized with COVID have been men. 55% who have tested positive are men, and 62% of the deaths have been men. 
Um, with that, again, that's a that's a crude but important measure to have there. That takes us to the point of why more men? What is happening there? Um, globally, we know this mirrors lots of other health issues. Men die on average, as we know globally, five years earlier than women. We don't know how much of that is social, is social determinants, and how much of that is biological. What we do know and need to affirm is that it's always both, and it's typically interacting. Um, we've done a review recently of the global burden of disease data pre-COVID that found that 40 per, that, that basically 40% of men's early death can be explained by three factors. One of those is smoking, and well, actually nutrition in first place, smoking in second place, alcohol in third place. We certainly have seen some of the data that smoking has been implicated, and we think nutrition is as well, as some of the social factors related to men. Um, China, we know men's smoking rates are about twice that of women. Certainly, given the, the effects of the disease on, on the respiratory system, that's one of the factors we think is involved. Italy, we don't see quite that big a gap, but almost 30% of men smoke in Italy compared to 19% of women. U.S., the difference is about 18% of men, 14% of women. That's clearly there. We also have to look at men's limited health-seeking behavior. Men, as we know from the HIV pandemic, are less likely to go for testing and preventive services. They're less likely to go for follow-up to know if they're positive or if they have a given disease. There's some data as well showing that men are less likely to follow some of the recommendations around hygiene and hand washing. Um, we also see at some households that women are the ones reminding men to be doing hygiene and hand washing, among other things. So it's still too early to know all these factors, but it is important to say we know it's probably both. There are both biological and social determinant issues. Point three, and I think this one seems to be really missing, or missing at least as much as it could be talked about, is which men as well as which women. It's really tough to find data that breaks down beyond um, simply men versus women. We've got some data in the U.S. suggesting and affirming in some settings Chicago, Michigan, Washington, D.C., that the impact is disproportionate on men of color, particularly African-American, but we've seen some of the data out of New York on Latino men. So clearly there's other things going on, and I think the descriptions that we've heard of the reasons we've heard, at least in the public health field in the U.S. the last couple of days, have been really inadequate of talking about the structural disadvantages that populations of color and men of color and women of color face, whether it's historical housing discrimination, unemployment and underemployment, historical poverty, access to health services. Um, my partner works on the front line of the response to the Latino population here in D.C. We see how much the immigrant population is fearful even of using any, any health services. So that complex of issues, and I've seen little discussion that looks at both gender and looks at these other intersectional issues. The fourth point I think is important to make is that it's intersectional, sorry, that it's relational. Um, this is not about saying, oh, we need to pay more attention to men or more attention to women. What happens with high rates of men's mortality, whether from COVID or other external causes, women often pick up the pieces. These are households affected when men die earlier um, and when men don't get the attention they need. Men's lack of, the lack of services for men and men's lack of use of services is an additional burden on the already unequal care burden that women are facing both before COVID and during COVID. So where do we go with this? Um, a few key recommendations. One, we need data. We've got to convince the public health field and those who, although this might not be the exact moment to do it, but to say um, it's not a gender lens simply by offering sex dis disaggregated data. We need much deeper in terms of getting at the intersectionalities of it, because that's really where we come up with the best responses for specific groups of women at higher risk and why. And particularly as we move to the response phase, we need the similar kind of granular approach that asks about sex disaggregation, but also looks at these other social factors. Um, I think we need to also put this in the framework of universal health care. If you look at a few countries that are doing better on this, um, Portugal, one of those, as you look at the numbers, it is mostly about universal access and starting early. No one being turned away from services, no questions asked about who gets the services, those kinds of universal health system approaches seem to work much better. Whatever gender lens we apply needs to be within that. The third point is that we need to think about promoting a culture of self-care and care for men, whether it's doing an equal amount of care at home um, and also how we care for our bodies as men. That's been an issue discussed by Global Action on Men's Health and WHO on how do we 
promote changes in masculinity so that men do more of this. And just as a final point, we did a survey with parents in the U.S. just as COVID was beginning to hit, asking them about their expectations of their sons and disturbing to see how many continue to push their sons into a or believe their sons are stuck in a box that doesn't let them show vulnerability. It would be yeah, give you some data points for that. 66% of parents say their sons don't feel comfortable showing when they're scared. 72% say their sons don't feel comfortable showing when they're sad. 41% say their sons feel pressure to hide their feelings if they feel either of these things. And 45% of their sons feel pressure not to cry. As you think about what this pandemic means, the pressure, the loss, the loss of livelihoods, we need men being able to connect up with our need to be empathetic, to be connected, to be vulnerable and to support those who are vulnerable. So I think we've got to look at there's both an opportunity and a crisis. Households locked with women unable to leave violent relationships is creating a tremendous vulnerability and huge um, huge disadvantages for women at the moment. The opportunity is that we've probably never had as many parents as home with their children, and including particularly fathers at home with children. And I think this is a tremendous opportunity moment as well, while we work diligently to protect women from harm. I also think we have an amazing opportunity to get fathers and mothers to talk to their sons about healthy masculinity. You have no excuse that you're not in the same room together to be able to do this. So as we move ahead, I think those are issues that need to be talked about. Looking at the structural, looking at social determinants, looking at gender beyond sex disaggregation, and thinking about how we promote, while we call men out for their use of violence and protect women who are experiencing it and children, we also use this as a moment to promote equitable, healthy ideas of manhood. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry, and especially for highlighting the intersectionality as a priority, right, in order for us to most effectively target the at-risk populations and, and be able to support their, their households in addition to them as individuals. Um, some of what you touched on on violence and on care, I know other speakers are going to pick up on, um, but just to stick to the health dimensions for now, I'm going to turn to my colleague, Carly Krubner, who is a policy fellow at CGD. Um, to think about while the health workforce is mobilized to address the needs of those who have been infected and need immediate treatment, uh, in tandem, the development of a vaccine. And Carly's research has delved into some of the exclusionary aspects of these vaccine development efforts uh, for, for other diseases. Carly, can you speak to what the risks are and for whom of a vaccine effort for COVID-19 being exclusionary and, and what we can do to prevent that? Sure. Thanks so much, Megan, and, and thank you all for this opportunity to share this work and to have this discussion. Um, so I'll start by just saying that I think one of the more remarkable aspects of the response to COVID-19 so far has been by far the most rapid deployment of resources to try and have the innovation in clinical countermeasures um, against this virus. Um, we've seen just tremendous efforts um, among the scientific and public health community and among funders to try and bring about both therapeutics and vaccines um, at a, a pace that is unparalleled in past epidemics. But I think as we're seeing these rapid movements um, and, and progress going forward, we need to be really attentive to some of the, the sex differences and gender implications of R&D efforts and ultimately deployment efforts. Um, and in particular, my work is focused on how pregnant women have been noticeably absent or overlooked in the context of R&D efforts. Um, so this is building on a very long history in which uh, women, regardless of pregnancy status, were broadly excluded from, from clinical research, from medical research. Uh, and that really only started to change in the 90s when we started to see um, some regulatory shifts. We had the NIH Revitalization Act um, to really recognize that women are not just men. We can't apply the same science. Their bodies are different. Um, and to actually shift the default there to say, well, you can't just exclude women. You need to have a good justification for why. And we started to see much broader inclusion of, of women in clinical research efforts. We're still lagging a bit behind on a number of areas. Uh, but it did improve. But as we saw that progress for women as, an, as a much larger category, there was still one group that was sort of categorically left behind. And that's pregnant women. 
Um, so just to put the scale of this problem in perspective, and again, this isn't just vaccines or epidemic countermeasures. This is sort of overall drugs, vaccines, biologics. So if you look at drugs that were approved by the FDA between 2000 and 2010, 97% of those drugs came to market with a completely undetermined risk in pregnancy. Um, so that means we really hadn't done any study in them um, or even very minimal animal studies that gave us no conclusive results. Um, potentially even more disheartening is the fact that if you go to market with that status of undetermined risk, the estimated average time it takes to move from undetermined to we have some sense of what risk is involved is 27 years. So most pregnant women and their providers are facing a generation's lag of data to inform their clinical decisions and choices. I'll also note, given that I'm going to switch focus very soon to talk specifically about vaccines, is to this day, we have yet to have a single vaccine that has been licensed with a specific indication for use in pregnancy. Now, this may be shocking to some of you who know about widespread maternal immunization efforts and the number of vaccines that we do actually actively recommend to give in pregnancy, um, but it just underscores the fact that the research pathway to get to licensure has not been inclusive um, or robust enough to actually have an indication for these products, and the labels almost always have these precautionary notes, consult your provider before using X. Um, and this has really problematic implications for both policy decisions and clinical decisions. Um, I guess one other note to say is that, you know, again, in the same way that women aren't just men with slightly smaller bodies and breasts, pregnant women are not just women with big bellies. So it's really important to do this study because there are dramatic physiological changes uh, in the pregnant body that occur, and that includes um, changes to metabolism and changes to the immune system. So we actually do need to study therapeutics and vaccines to have a better understanding of their efficacy, of their safety, um, and also of appropriate dosing strategies, because that might actually look quite different in the pregnant woman than it would in other types of patient populations. And I know that a lot of efforts have been made and people are kind of skipping certain steps um, or potentially moving at a much more accelerated pace in the context of moving forward um, clinical countermeasures for COVID-19. But the need for appropriate data for these interventions for the population at large, but especially for pregnant women, is also true when we have epidemic threats and when we're moving even faster. Um, and this is because, at least for many pathogens, uh, we know that there is disproportionate risk to pregnant women and their fetuses from infection. Um, and we also know that, in many cases, there aren't going to be opportunities to do post-market study the way that we would normally say we might proceed with something that's just kind of around all the time. Um, emerging and re-emerging pathogens pose really difficult challenges for how you actually collect adequate data when there's unpredictability about how long that uh, particular infectious disease is going to be around. So with that, um, I know that we don't actually know yet, uh, it's still very early on with COVID-19, we don't know that pregnant women are at increased risk. Um, there are some data that we can draw on from MERS and SARS, but again, we really don't know. Um, but what we do know is that there are about 200 million pregnant women out there globally who are potentially at risk of infection. And there's nothing to say that they would be at lower risk of infection. Uh, we also know that there are a high proportion of frontline workers, of healthcare workers, who are uh, women of reproductive potential. So I think particularly for a lot of women, and I know personally a number of women who uh, are going into clinic or going to hospitals uh, pregnant and very anxious about what it means if they get infected, not only for themselves, but also for their developing babies. Um, just checking, I just got a notice that my blue jeans quit unexpectedly. Can you still hear me? I can hear you well. Keep going if you okay. want to keep Keep giving Great, I'll keep going. I just wanted to, to make sure, and apologies for that. Um, I seem to be having a few computer snafus today, of course, just in time for the webinar. Um, great. Um, so that's all to say that even if pregnant women are not at disproportionate risk from COVID, um, but are at equal or similar risk to other populations, out of, out of a duty of social justice, we owe it to them to be inclusive of their needs as we move forward. Um, and what we have seen again and again is that 
pregnant women tend to fall into this default category of exclusion. If you look at the exclusion criteria for nearly any clinical trial, it's sort of, a, we'll just throw pregnant and lactating women at that mix. And I'm not talking about lactating women today, but I could say many of the same things that I've said uh, about uh, pregnant women applies as well to, to lactating women. So what we've seen is that they get excluded from research activities, um, near categorically excluded. Um, this was certainly the case in the Ebola trials uh, of uh, the West African outbreak when we we're looking at vaccines, as well as a number of therapeutics. And then we're left with this conundrum that uh, we don't have the data that we would want or need to make policies, decisions, to make um, decisions about the rollout of these interventions. And then out of an abundance of, of caution, I would say probably usually out of too much precaution, uh, we exclude them from the deployment of very beneficial interventions as well. And it becomes this vicious and unjust cycle of exclusion um, where we just presume that we can't do this research because we don't know the risks and then we don't include them and then we don't have the evidence that we need and then we exclude them from rollout and then we're never able to generate an appropriate evidence base to fairly include pregnant women. And in the meantime, they're often dying and often dying at disproportionate levels. Um, so for those of you who are interested, there's a remarkable paper about how this played out in the context of Ebola uh, called Protected to Death um, about the systematic exclusion from trials. And, and the idea is really to avoid repeating the mistakes that we've made in the past um, and instead move from this vicious cycle of exclusion to a presumption of inclusion where we appropriately and ethically include pregnant women in the research that we're conducting at much earlier stages, again, based on an appropriate risk-benefit assessment, where we then have the data that we need to inform assessments of safety, assessments of effectiveness, and then we can appropriately include pregnant women everywhere who may benefit from vaccines and other types of interventions in the deployment of these tools. Um, and one thing just to note about this in the context of vaccine development is that we're seeing a really exciting and interesting shift in vaccine science where we're moving towards platform technologies so that that way the next time that there is a new vaccine against an emerging pathogen, whether or not it's a, another novel coronavirus or whether it is a hemorrhagic fever or whether it's any of the priority pathogens that the WHO has outlined, the hope is that we can leverage the existing platforms and technologies that have been developed through innovations now to essentially swap out the antigen and move forward to that. So not only is the risk of exclusion problematic for COVID-19, both this epidemic and, and future emergences, but also potentially for a much broader range of epidemic threats. So recognizing this problem, um, a number of colleagues and I have been part of something called the PREVENT Working Group. Um, so PREVENT is an acronym for the Pregnancy Research Ethics for Vaccines, Epidemics, and New Technologies. Um, and this project was essentially saying, well, there's got to be concrete solutions and recommendations that can be done. We can't continue to repeat this default of exclusion, and there have to be ways that we can move forward from here. So we launched a set of guidance uh, about a year and a half ago to essentially roadmap what this would look like in the context of emerging and epidemic threats across uh, the life cycle of a product. So I recognize that I don't have time to go into all of the details of the guidance, but I'll, I'll highlight a few of the areas that we touched on that, that play out across the preparedness phase, um, then focus a bit more on R&D, but also in the context of rollout. So the first thing is something that we need to be doing right now, and that is really um, addressing in our surveillance activities, in our case reporting, the evidence gap about we actually have no idea what the pathophysiology is of COVID-19 and pregnancy. Um, and we've seen in the past that there's been very limited data, even just collecting pregnancy status, let alone um, pregnancy-specific outcomes for both um, the mom and the baby. Um, it's been really heartening to see in this context that there have already been some pregnancy registries set up to say, okay, if you have been uh, infected with COVID-19 and um, are experiencing symptoms, please provide your data so that we can start to capture this and have a much broader evidence base to understand what the risks and what the disease manifestations are in pregnancy. Um, so there's one group at UCSF that's already started to do this called the Priority uh, Registry. But the hope is that, you know, this is a global pandemic and the extent to which we can really build out um, the evidence just around 
um, how pregnant women and their and their babies may be impacted by infection is going to be incredibly important, and it's something we need to be doing right now. The second thing is we need to start thinking about um, about R and D and moving up our timelines to be able to actually make better risk assessments and be able to appropriately include them in evaluations of new products. So the first piece of this is something called reproductive toxicology studies. Um, and these are usually animal studies that just look at potential fetal risks of a new product. And they usually don't occur until just before licensure of a product. Um, those need to start happening almost immediately, especially for some of the most promising vaccines that are already moving into phase one trials now. Because what happens is if we don't do them now, it becomes a huge barrier for fair inclusion down the road when we get to field trials and larger scale studies. Second piece is that for all of the candidates that are advancing through the pipeline, we need to be thinking really carefully about how these products can include study of pregnant women, prospective evaluation of pregnant women um, in their clinical development plan. So whether or not this is inclusion in larger scale studies once we're at sort of the phase three point, or whether or not this is a parallel study, we actually need to be looking at specific outcomes, enrolling pregnant women in studies, looking at safety, looking at uh, immunogenicity, and really getting a better sense of how well these work and, and what kinds of implications there might be. And the last piece is really a, a call to kind of shift away from this default of exclusion and, and to say any time that there is uh, a study that is excluding pregnant women, um, particularly studies that have prospect of direct benefit to those women and or those developing uh, fetuses, that any, any exclusion requires justification based on scientific and ethical rationale. So this requires a careful risk benefit analysis done by people who um, have the appropriate expertise to do this, so by those who are maternal and fetal health specialists. Um, and the only time that they should be excluded is when the risk of those interventions outweigh the benefits of being protected against COVID-19 infections. Uh, and that would be a real sea change in this space, but I think it's a really important and really necessary one. Um, and this, this is essentially grounded on, on two calls, on two claims of social justice. So one, um, that these women who could directly benefit um, and have this prospect of benefit from enrolling in trials shouldn't just be denied because of their pregnancy status, um, while other populations who are at risk are able to enroll and potentially uh, receive the benefit of directly participating in studies. But it also has much broader justice implications for all pregnant women who might ultimately be able to benefit from these uh, interventions in the future. So I hope that that helps outline some of these issues and some of the recommendations. For those of you who are interested, you can check out uh, pregnancyethics.org uh, to learn more about this project and the recommendations, but uh, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you so much, Carly. And I wanna pick up on the theme that you highlighted of overprotection and the potential unintended consequences of that. Uh, by turning now to Amber Peterman, who is an associate professor at UNC Chapel Hill um, and has led a group of us recently and rapidly uh, to do a review based on past pandemics and other crisis contexts and uh, bringing together some of the evidence of what we know about increased violence against women and children, as Gary alluded to earlier in the conversation. Amber, can you tell us, you know, based on the research that was done, what are some of the potential pathways for increased violence or different forms of it? And then what are some of the policy solutions and recommendations for how to address these risks? Yeah, so thanks, Megan, and everyone listening in. So like many of you, I'm, I'm happy to be here talking about this important topic and wish it was under sort of different circumstances. But so anyone who's been kind of paying attention to the media lately has perhaps seen indications of both increases in frequency, but as well complexity and severity of different types of violence. And there's been a lot um, coming out. The volume is actually quite frightening. And I think it's also been a bit demoralizing for people who work in this area because they've, you know, worked really hard to make kind of small gains over the last years. 
So I want to talk about the research, as Megan mentioned, but first perhaps two kind of framing points. And I think the first point is that given the information we have, it's really hard to say what kind of the magnitude and dynamics are that's actually going on. So um, I'll come back to this because I think it's really important to know that sort of calls to helplines and police reports give us a really imperfect picture of what's actually happening inside the home. And secondly, I think more generally, um, it's important to remember that COVID is not sort of the underlying cause of violence, right? So it may be intensifying or magnifying different risk factors, um, but we're kind of experiencing this unprecedented shock. But in reality, in many settings, these risk factors always, already exist and violence is already normalized and, and a huge problem. So this is driven, of course, by underlying gender inequalities and power dynamics. And I think that framing is important to keep in mind when we're thinking about pathways and, and certain solutions um, in the COVID setting. So even though we're in this kind of new evolving situation, as Megan mentioned, we do have research to draw on. And I had the pleasure of leading an interdisciplinary group um, to conduct a review of pandemics and the effects on violence against women and children. And this was released last week on the CGD website. So you can go and kind of look at that and look at all the details. But what I wanted to do is kind of talk you through the main results. So what we try to do in the paper is essentially three things. So first we look at public public health emergencies, other pandemics, economic crises, disasters, and we try and say, okay, what does the literature say about these potential pathways that might be playing out? Second, we look at kind of the prevention literature um, according to the different pathways we do find and say what could possibly be done in, in diverse pandemic settings. And then third, we discuss a potential research agenda going forward. So the first thing I wanna talk about, and hopefully I can make my screen share work here, you should see a lovely graphic coming up, um, is the nine pathways we found. So this was kind of the first thing we looked into, and I'm not going to talk through all of the different pathways, but I just wanted to highlight three of them. So the first I wanted to talk about is the economic insecurity and poverty related stress uh, pathway, and that's at the very top. And we know there's a large body of literature linking um, economic factors, including poverty, housing insecurity, food insecurity, unemployment, um, and there are negative associated coping strategies to violence against women and children. We already know the economic effects of COVID are going to be severe and they're going to be long lasting. And this really has serious implications for many types of violence, including intimate partner violence and child maltreatment. So the second pathway I wanted to touch on is the second, which is the quarantines and social isolation pathway. So there is a, a systematic review evidence linking sort of quarantines to poor mental health and mental disorders, increases in stress, as well as simply kind of um, more day-to-day -day exposure to potential perpetrators. We also know that um, social isolation is a well-established tactic that perpetrators use to control survivors. So sort of social distancing in general may exacerbate this dynamic. And we also know that parenting may be particularly challenging under kind of close quarters and unusual cir stressful circumstances. And this might lead to higher rates of child maltreatment or violent discipline. And the last pathway I just want to touch on is number four, which is exposure to exploitative relationships due to changing demographics. And this is the idea that, you know, within uh, areas where there's increased mortality and morbidity, this may leave children without stable care situations, and especially adolescent girls or widows who might be affected could be vulnerable to exploitation. And we've seen this come out quite strongly from the literature around the Ebola epidemic and the HIV pandemic. So I wanted to touch on that fourth one because I think that it's important that we also take kind of a longer view in, in, in thinking about how some of these pathways might play out, even though we are, of course, very concerned about the immediate response. So these pathways aren't, of course, exhaustive, but they were the ones that we found kind of the largest body of rigorous literature supporting them. And of course, they might interact with each other um, 
And this is all to say, of course, that we believe that there is quite a potential and a risk for heightened diverse forms of violence. And I just wanted to pull out two of the quotes from the paper kind of to illustrate some of these pathways. So the first quote you see with the white background is a female beneficiary of a cash transfer program in Turkey. And she's talking about kind of the economic insecurity pathway and how for poor fights come from this kind of suffering of being poor. And then the quote in the blue background is a pathway that I didn't have time to touch on, but it's the idea that there could be increases in both kind of frequency and severity of violence because of a lack of health sector uh, ability to respond, paired with, of course, the potential for reduced help seeking because of fears of catching um, the virus. And, and this one, this quote is from the National Domestic Violence Hotline in the United States talking about um, a helpline call where a woman is scared to go to the ER because of fears around catching COVID-19. So what can we do? Of course, this is very important and I think um, there are a number of different policy responses. We try to talk about eight of these in the paper following different pathways and I won't read all of these, but of course there's a lot of more information in the working paper um, in addition to a compilation of kind of operational guides and implementation tools that we put in the annex. But these kind of potential responses include things like expanding and reinforcing economic social safety nets, expanding shelter and um, safe temporary housing for survivors and encouraging informal or virtual social support networks. And I think it is quite um, promising to see that there have been some governments who have uh, responded in kind of numerous different innovative ways, um, including, for example, Canada, um, Italy, France, and Australia have been kind of first movers trying to pro propose innovative solutions. However, I do also worry that kind of in the places where this might be needed the most, many of these options may not be possible or feasible and many of the basic services um, may not even exist. So last I, I wanted to, so last I wanted to kind of talk about a potential research agenda going forward so that we won't be flying blind next time. And here we kind of group these into three different buckets. So first is simply understanding the magnitude of the problem. So in reality, as I alluded to previously, we actually have little understanding of how diverse forms of violence might play out during a pandemic and what subgroups might be most at risk. And so I wanna give you two kind of anecdotes um, to illustrate this. And first is the, the issue that, you know, in, even in the best of times, we know that less than 7% of women seek formal help from combined health, legal, and social services. So you can see that kind of this is really the tip of the iceberg that we're seeing right now. And the second kind of anecdote is that we are actually seeing decreases in reports of some forms of violence. For example, child maltreatment, which is often triggered through education systems that are no longer functioning. So we really need to know kind of more just uh, in general, uh, what is going on? What is the magnitude of the problem? The second thing I think we need to do is we need better information on mechanisms and how they might play out in different contextual settings. And the third thing we need to know more about, of course, is what works. So including um, what works in the medium, short and long term and how cost effective these response options might be. And I know that it has been quite encouraging to see all the rapid data collection um, being done to inform the COVID-19 response. However, I do also want to caution that um, collecting this type of data uh, on violence against women or children is quite ethically complex. So even in, in a non-crisis situation, right? It needs to be done very intentionally and carefully. Um, that said, I think there are many ongoing studies that are focused on violence prevention already uh, that are well positioned to tackle these questions going forward. So I think I'm hopeful that we will be able to both fill some of these gaps going forward and kind of use this 
um, crisis as a way to shine a light on, on violence in general and the need for more prevention efforts. So that's all from me, and I look forward to continuing the discussion. Thank you, Amber. I'm going to turn now to Buki Williams, who is CEO of a nonprofit called Education as a Vaccine, to complement some of the comments that Amber just provided from the research side, um, because Buki's work is obviously directly interfacing with some of these girls in Nigeria um, who are at risk right now. So Buki, can you speak to what you're seeing within the Nigerian context in terms of increased risks of violence, what some of the necessary responses are there, and then broader gendered risks, uh, including sexual and reproductive health and rights risks that you focus on through your nonprofit? Um, thanks very much. And like everybody has said, I'm really excited to be part of this conversation. I agree that it's such a very vital and important one that we need to be having right now. And I think in a country like Nigeria, which is facing this pandemic with various issues already existing, issues, political issues, social issues, I think this um, pandemic just heightens um, some of these concerns that we have. And I think going back to what um, Amber said about violence, it's not that the pandemic is the reason for it. It's just showing this fault lines and this point that are causing, um, that are heightening some of these issues. And I think it's really important to highlight that Nigeria has, you know, shown a strong response to this through the, through the national uh, control for diseases and they've been focused on COVID and our health system is really focused on it and they're trying to address some of the economic impacts as well. But there are issues that we see in terms of if the health system is focused specifically on COVID, what does that mean for the other needs that we have? If, for example, we see a lockdown that's happening in, in at least three states in Nigeria, including where I live in Abuja and in Lagos, it's happening in open states. And then it's also happening in other states who want to make sure they're protecting their citizens. So there's curfews, there's most schools have closed right now, which we know that closures of schools means kids are at home. And that means it increases their risk of, you know, related, but then where do they seek for help and how do they get help? And that's difficult to do when there's a lockdown because it then means that, for example, um, you don't know who to call, you don't know who to ask for help, or even if you tell your parent or you tell a guardian, how do they know who to call for, for help? And so for a lot of us who were working on the ground, who are being forced to work from home or who are being forced in a sense to say, we can't no longer go into the community large gatherings you know you need to practice social distancing so we needed to scale back some of our projects but a lot of us came together and said we needed to have conversations of what do we do how do we still continue to meet needs how do we still continue to provide services and what do we do during a lockdown for some of us we already are using technology tools so for example with education as a vaccine we have a platform called my question and answer because we already knew that just because of social, cultural norms, that getting access to SGBV information, getting access to sexual reproductive health information that is accurate, that is non-judgmental, that is youth-friendly was already difficult. So we had already tried to create a safe space online through WhatsApp, through SMS, through phone calls, through Facebook, um, Instagram, all of the spaces where we know young people are to make sure we're providing this information. So of course, but that means we only have access to young people who have information. So we have to start talking to different groups and what you've seen on the ground is a response to that. So there's been a lot of radio jingles that have been happening so that we can actually share information. You've seen also reaching out and um, doing some level of outreach of those who are community workers, also sharing some of that, that information. And really us thinking through what are the advocacy we need to be doing as well at the national level and at the state level as well. And so one of the things we were pushing for um, is making sure that service provision still exists and that it's important. And so one of the things we started pushing for was, can we make sure that gender-based violence services are essential services? 
because what happens is that if you're deemed an essential service then you're able to move around um unfortunately for most of us like you know nigeria as well did not immediately say oh it's going to be an essential service it required us pushing and having conversations and saying this needs to happen but apart from that as well, even if we push for it to be an essential service, the question then becomes, if the gender desk in the police unit is open, if a shelter is open, how do we protect those who are providing services? How do we continue to maintain social distancing? How do we provide masks, gloves, sanitizers, all of those things that so we had to come together, some through fundraising, to raise money to provide that or some through pushing and saying they deserve that if they're a government service or to talk to those who are running shelters who are having those conversations of you know what level of protection can we can we provide can we let someone come in not knowing what their status is because we want to protect those who are already in the shelter so it became those kind of conversations of could there be an isolation unit in the you provide sanitizers and things before they enter so this is a lot of a lot of conversations we are in i think i saw in amber's presentation we are in uncharted territories for the very first time in a long time um and this does feel like now more than ever is where we do need to be creative in terms of what we're pushing for and we know that we cannot leave these issues of knowing that most young girls have been very susceptible to exposure to exploitation um, now they're at home or worried in in states where we pushed for girl education that now that school is going to be closed for a year what does that mean because the likelihood of them going back to school now becomes an issue right because you've already been successful first about making sure they could go to school but then if they're going to be home for at least a year or how many months then it's like ah do they need to go back to school is it really necessary would they have money to be able to cover the fact that they would need to go back to school because even if school is free there are hidden costs that you do see. And I think that's really important to, to highlight. But even in the caregiving role that they're providing, who has to go and fetch water? You know, who has, you know, and all of those things. And if they're facing a lockdown, do they have to leave the community to go further to go get um, these resources to bring back? So there's really a lot of conversation in, in how we do it. So for us, like we've been pushing, how do we make um, GBV essential services? How do we provide support for each other um, within those services? How do we better coordinate um, what countries like South Africa and Kenya, you're seeing that data already exists, like people are already collecting data. So for example, recently in South Africa, they mentioned that they've got over 87,000 cases open already. We know that that's possible. Um, in Nigeria, but we don't have those numbers yet. So how do we better work together to coordinate um, to ensure that we're collecting all of these data and that we can do the analysis and we can do the research? Um, how do we become creative in, in making sure um, that we're reaching people? So yes, of course, the jingles, we're putting as many helplines um, as possible. You have centers who are willing to stay open. So you have Miraval Center, that's a sexual assault referral center. Um, they made sure they could get transportation from the um, from Lagos State. They made sure that they could at least be able to open from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. So you're seeing those um, those kind of things. You're also seeing that in terms of SIHR services, that doesn't go away, right? Or for women who are pregnant, I'm um, doing a lockdown. How are they supposed to get to a facility? You know, because taxis no longer are running, buses are no longer running. So, of course, that's another advocacy that we need to go back to the government to say we need to provide it. But you also see in Lagos State um, being able to be um, giving birth during this period or who has any emergency surgery that they wouldn't have to pay any fees whatsoever. We're hoping other states could do that and we want to push it. Um, in other states and continue of course to leverage on technology it is an it's imperfect but it's better than nothing so that if you do need someone to talk to if we do need to do counseling over the phone or conflict resolution over the phone and that's already been done we can at least do that until we know that you need a shelter or we need to remove you from harm and then we'll do something about that there's also the need for a very strong prevention campaign which I think a lot of us are also working on, on how do we provide information um, on those who no longer want to be abusers or those who say, I need help and I need somebody to talk to. How do we make sure that that information um, gets to them and we, and we do that?
So I think it's quite important um, to continue to push for things that we've wanted before COVID-19 came in, but to continue to ensure that COVID-19 provides the opportunity to make sure we get all the services in. How many shelters can we get um, during this time? How many, um, how can we make primary healthcare facilities that the closest one in the communities, first responders really, the first place a person goes to, how can we make sure they have all of the information before they, they refer? And I think those are all very critical and important things that we, we are pushing for. Sometimes it can feel very demoralizing because you feel like you're pushing for it. And even if you don't have the research in Nigeria, you're saying we're seeing the trends from around the world and we know it's happening here. How can we make sure we respond um, before things get too bad? I think I will stop there. Thank you, Buki. And I'm going to turn to Crystal now on exactly the point you left off on uh, to touch on what folks are calling for that they may have been calling for for a while. Um, but as we've all touched on, the magnification of some of these inequalities that we have to address. So Crystal Simeone is the economic justice lead at a pan-African feminist network called Feminet. Um, and she's written recently on COVID-19 uh, from one vantage point of some of the advantages that certain African countries have um, in preparedness, having had to deal with the 2014 Ebola outbreak. Um, but on the other hand is, of course, mobilizing with civil society partners to fill gaps um, and to call upon African country governments and donors to, to be doing that in a gender responsive way. So, Crystal, you have the floor. Thank you, Megan. Um, I'll take off from where Buki left off when she um, gave a perfect example of what it is like to be living through this pandemic on the continent. And I think for us, um, we're faced, you know, between a rock and a hard place. It's very hard to figure out what to do for a lot of our governments, where 70% of our, over 70% in many countries of our population, of our economic system, of our labor force is, is informal. Um, we know that without, in the absence of a vaccine, what we have is social engineering in the form of, of social physical distancing. I call it physical distancing and not social distancing. Um, but in the in the absence of of a vaccine, that's all we have. Faced with an economy structure and a labor structure that we have, it's almost impossible to copy and paste lockdowns in the way the rest of the world is doing. Um, Buki gave really great examples of what this means for women, um, and you can see our government struggling to figure out how to how to balance these things. Um, I'd like to point out the system, the things that we're seeing now are really structural failures and, and historical failures. And somebody said, we can't go back to normal because normal is the problem. And this really brings to the fore where all this and for us on the continent, where the cruelty really of neoliberalism plays its part and is really strict stripping down health systems, stripping down public services and goods, both in terms of resources, but also in terms of perception. And I think there's something to be said around the politics of, per of perception and of narratives, where public services and goods have been so stripped away by a capitalist and neoliberal approach that's, that pushes the idea of, of privatization, with the World Bank and the IFI is now pushing for PPPs, for example, and this notion that private is better than public and what does that do for government where we're in a state of crisis at the moment and when we need our leadership to stand up and and, sh and you know guide us through this but there's a constant um sort of doubt in what they are able to do because it's public and that that social contract between state and and, and, and citizen has been so stripped down by all this you know the neoliberal agenda um, we've also seen um, weakening of systems through donor funding, for example, where there's a lot of vertical approaches, um, this focus on malaria, this focus on HIV and AIDS, rather than looking at systems holistically. Um, where intersections of GBV, of SRH are issues, of economics, of access, of access to public services and goods like water, of public public goods all, all over um, that stripped down into very insular um, sort of very specific issues that means it's harder to fight a, pand a pandemic like this. Um, um, but also met with our governance structures um, and our our history of 
colonialism. And you can see there's been comparisons made of British colonies having the very same violence meted out on their populations. Um, we, at the very beginning of our lock of our it's not a lockdown that we have in Kenya, but a more of a curfew from 7 p.m. to 5 a.m. At the beginning, we had more deaths from violent um, police action on citizens than we did have, actually have from the pandemic. So it brings into question this policing state and how we're going to roll back on that, in, as well as the surveillance of our people and what that means um, moving forward. Um, so we do know that the pandemic will disrupt our economy. We know that. Um, there's an interesting issue that comes up that speaks to the mobility of Africans because currently on the continent, there's a perception that the, the virus is um, a wealthy virus. It's, it's one for people who are able to travel overseas, who fly. And there's a good example in Kenya. They're shutting down um, golf clubs. And they say, well, you can play your golf, uh, just the caddies can't come because, you know, golf players might, there's a risk that the golf players might transmit it to to the caddies. And this, this changes a perception where um, infectious diseases on the continent have usually moved from more informal settlements and poorer populations um, rather than the, the reverse. And this this also talks about an inequality of travel and access to travel and, and what that means in a global perspective. Um, I think we also have to bring to the fore that this is also moving countries to be more nationalist about their approach to both the economy and and public health care and what it means for multilateralism, where we know that a lot of our problems are have global solutions. And so where can we begin to reignite a different kind of multilateralism where we begin to look at things like healthcare as a global public good, I think is an important area to look at. And we can see that being stripped away very rapidly in these times. But I'd like to also talk about how Africa has um, community social capital. With the stripping away that I spoke about of, of, of the social contract, it means that citizens are very many a time left to their own devices and left to self-coordinate, self-mobilize. And that might come in useful at this point where we're able to mobilize at community levels exactly what uh, Bukiu talked about. How can we make sure that we're doing that in a structured way? Um, and I think we have a history of doing that and that might come in um, useful. Um, we also have to remember that Government revenue is falling. Governments across the continent are looking to, you know, give people tax rebates, right? Um, but then also how many people are in the tax bracket is is a question that, that is brought up. But even those that are, it means that government is reducing their revenue at a time when they so badly need the revenue. So what a number of people, both civil society and government, as well as institutions are calling for is is as debt moratoriums. Um, and Ramaphosa has been at the at the front of this call as a chair of the African Union and has began leading this process and is one that needs to have all African countries come together to do. Um, getting African countries has been a problem um, coming together, but I think these are unusual times for us and it, it's something that will have to be done um, to be able to ensure that we have the money because we have borrowed debt. We're not going to be developing any in infrastructure, building bridges or anything. And so rather than looking for more debt for countries and economies that are so overburdened in debt in the first place, we need to be calling for a moratorium on debt and redirecting the money that we already have towards ensuring that we're able to spend in the right places and at the right time. Um, so the World Bank also forecasts that the sub-Saharan region um, our economic growth for 2020 will drastically contract. Um, Sub-Saharan Africa will lose 37 to $79 billion in output losses due to trade and value chain disruptions, amongst other factors. And so we be need to begin to look at what happens after this, what happens to our populations, our economies, what happens in a, in a world that is so integrated in terms of economy, but also public policy. Um, where, where does that leave us? Um, we also need to um, we also need to remember that in as much as this is a global pandemic, we have a whole lot of other things going on. East Africa has seen the worst locust invasion in a long time, and they're predicting um, the next phase is coming in. That ties in with food availability and what that means for a country that um, economies are really on at their on their knees um, how are they going to be providing food to people when to, we're talking about cash transfers and food packages 
where does the money come from is the biggest question. Um, how do we feed people when we're asking to, to lock them down in spaces that are unsafe, but also where they can't access food in the face of locust invasion, for example, in East Africa, I think is a huge problem. Um, and, and speaking to this, I, Gary spoke about the importance of, of data disaggregation, and for us on the continent, that has many layers, um, both by sex, but geographical location, by ethnicity, by religion. There's so many economic quintile. It means that whatever targeted approaches that we have will be determined by the state, and we need to begin to start collecting it from the African continent because we've had to leapfrog a number of things. Um, uh, we've had to leave. So we've used technology a lot. Bookie spoke about this. And there's a lot of initiatives happening that are getting citizen data, um, public data in, in, a, in collating, collating it in disaggregated ways. And so I think that's important. Um, it's not perfect, like Bookie said, but I think it's important to have. There's a little bit of hope in terms of um, Africa has had many times has been the manufacturing floor of very many things. Um, and so for Kenya, for example, we're now producing our own masks, our own PPE kits at, at a lower cost than, than we're able to import them. And that might mean that we are able to then maybe, if we have surplus, um, plug in the gaps in the global value chains. It's also important to note that a lot of these um, manufacturing floors are actually manned by women. Um, and it's also then making sure that there's an intersection of making sure that their working conditions are safe and this child care uh, provided for this, which again takes resources of which we don't have. But also in an interesting turn of events, our doctors are used to working with almost nothing. Um, they're used to developing things out of nothing. Today I saw there's some doctors who are developing how to break uh, ventilators into three ventilators from one. And so these are things they have, they're used to having to innovate on the spot in, in ways that global Northern medical spaces are not used to because they have the luxury of abundance. Usually it's, it's something that we don't have. And I think that's something that we have to remember. Um, and so I'll stop with a quote from a lady called Shefa Okore, who's Kenyan and is on the front line of the civil society movement. And she says, this virus is showing us that everything, and I mean everything we're forced to believe is impossible without, within our borders, is actually possible. We can do things and do things very well. We can reimagine behavior. We can lead by courageous, we can be led by courageous people, and we can depend on really just us. And I think that's a powerful, hopeful thing to say. We know that we are not anywhere close to the peak of this on the continent. As, as Bookie said, we don't even know how many cases we have. Our testing uh, levels are really low. But I think we have um, the experience of working with very infectious diseases on the continent. The African CDC is doing a lot of work to make sure that their coordinating approach. Um, our resources um, is, a, is a huge problem still. But also, it means that there's space for us to reimagine a different macroeconomic policy and landscape globally and one for the continent, but also one for our nations ind individually. And I think that's important as a way forward is, is it presents a, a space for us to, to do something differently that is so badly needed. And I'll stop there. Thank you, Crystal. And I think ending on a theme that we will pick up in discussion since there are already many questions coming in around COVID-19 as not just a crisis, but also an opportunity for the systemic change that you are alluding to. Um, I'm going to turn finally to Claire Wenham, who is an assistant professor at the London School of Economics, to delve into a topic that other speakers have alluded to briefly, and that is women and girls as caregivers, both as workers within the health workforce, sort of on the front lines as 70% of those who are dealing with this right now, and also within the households where they have the disproportionate unpaid care work and domestic responsibilities. Um, Claire, can you speak to some of those dynamics as well as what you have mobilized um, as a network through the new gender and COVID-19 working group? Of course, hi, good evening. Uh, well, evening for me in London at least. Um, I'm so thrilled to be here and amongst such a, a great lineup of erudite speakers. So it's a real, it's a real pleasure. Um, I wanted to follow on on something that was just covered, um, thinking about an opportunity. And actually, I think um, some of the other speakers have, 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 have highlighted that this is a fundamental gear change and this is something completely unprecedented. 
But um, work that I've done on previous outbreaks and, and work of, of colleagues of mine in this gender and COVID working group that I'll talk to in a minute, uh, we've looked at the uh, gendered vulnerabilities and gendered impacts of uh, major epidemics and outbreaks previously. And actually, I think that uh, a lot of it isn't unprecedented. A lot of it is exactly the same trend that we've seen in Zika, that we've seen in Ebola, that we've seen in cholera outbreaks. But I think what is giving me hope and what I think is a is a is a change is the recognition of it. Right. We've been beating this drum and saying, like, where are the women? Right. Asking that simple question to policymakers, to act to uh, practitioners. And I think the fact that we're having this conversation and the fact there's been so much um, media coverage, social media coverage of the issue of the, the gendered impact really encourages and gives me hope that maybe it's it's time that this will get recognized not only by those of us who uh you know work in this space and and uh, are feminists uh, but by the broader policy community so i want to talk about uh three things this evening that i think are really important when we talk uh, when we're talking about gendered impacts of covid and i'm hoping this is going to um sort of complete a bigger picture that other speakers have talked about so the first one is around the visibility question of women. So, so far, we've talked about women as pregnant women. We've talked about women as victims of violence. And I want to think about the kind of everyday women right, and the impact that women are having globally of this outbreak. Right. Which is that our lives have changed. Right. And that, you know, when when schools close, who is it that's going to pick up the additional burden of childcare? Well, you know, social norms of, of, of reproduction and social reproduction tell us that that's more likely to be women than men. We also know that domestic households have changed, right? Who's doing the additional cooking that might be happening during the day? Who's doing the additional housework that is, you know, because everyone's in the house the whole time, you're making more dirt. It's those everyday experiences that also need to be talked about. Because we imagine from previous outbreaks and from, from more, more general norms, uh, of, of gendered norms that this is going to be for women. And not just thinking about sort of everyday women uh, in terms of your private life, but I think another group that we need to think about are the other formal and informal workforce that are, that are predominantly women. So the, the, the main one that I think we need to talk about is healthcare workers that Megan alluded to. So 70% of the global workforce is uh, women. Uh, global healthcare, healthcare workforce, particularly frontline healthcare workers. And this is up to uh, almost 90% in Wuhan, uh, where the epicenter of the outbreak was initially. And the problem is that we also know that um, we are seeing trends of the outbreak appearing amongst healthcare workers. So if you're seeing, you know, increased rates of infection amongst healthcare workers, and most of those healthcare workers are women, we need to know that. That's a really important finding. And so this is really a, a, a plug that we've heard across the speakers tonight is we need to get more sex surrogated data to, to show this. Right. Um, we for, I know that currently there aren't global sex surrogated data sets that are comprehensive. The UN Women have done an amazing job this week publishing their the most up to date statistics they've got on it. But that was only uh, 400,000 odd cases, all right? And we're now at 1.5 million. And important to know, out of those 400,000 cases they put data on, 150,000 of those are from Spain. So my question is, what are other countries doing and why aren't they reporting the sex segregated data? Particularly because the, the, the Spanish data uh, that UN Women have published shows that there is a spike of uh, infection amongst women healthcare workers, right? And it's really stark and significant that spike. And so we really need this data, and it's a plea to to uh, to policymakers to make this data public, so that we can then ensure that we can push policymakers based on you know, numbers, which is what policymakers like, to ensure that women frontline healthcare workers have the necessary protective equipment to stop infection, right? That have the necessary uh, breaks from work, right? They even have the necessary sanitary protection. We, we heard stories in China of women not being provided with, with sanitary products, uh, while they were, you know, on their ward round. So we really need to, to ask these questions. But then there are other formal and informal workers that I think is a really important group to think about is the sort of domestic household or informal, uh, workers that we see in domestic spaces, uh, globally. <laughs> 
Interestingly, the first person to have died in Brazil of the coronavirus outbreak was a a female domestic worker working in a household for a middle class family who'd come back from Europe, right? And recognizing this domestic burden and the role that women play in the domestic world and life cycle and, and that this is their job is a really uh, important factor and potential vector for disease spread. So we need to recognize the everyday women in this. And, you know, this extends to you know, hospital cleaners and, and uh, delivery drivers and whoever else we see these low paid uh, jobs. This is particularly important in uh, low middle income settings where, you know, we're seeing these. We, we, we know that people have to go out to work to eat, right, to be able to get their, their, their daily income is what they need. And so social distancing is going to be a lot harder for these lower paid women than maybe other categories. So it's really important to think about. I am really aware that we're running out of time and I don't want I want to allow time for questions. But I just wanted to touch on um, the gender and COVID working group that Megan mentioned. So some colleagues of mine uh, from various institutions globally uh, got together at the beginning of this outbreak, having ex having worked in similar uh, in similar questions around gender and pandemics and gender and epidemics previously, and we formed a gender and COVID working group. The idea of this was to be a space for uh, anyone who was interested uh, to share ideas, share uh, research, share, you know, pitch ideas for for collaboration. And so, uh, you know, we are, it's very nascent, but we are definitely, um, you know, facilitating conversations which we hope otherwise wouldn't have happened or wouldn't have happened so holistically. So um, a, a, a plea to anyone who wants to come and join us, please do get in touch. Thank you, Claire, and thank you for organizing many of us because that was how Amber and myself and co-authors got the, the working paper on violence against women and children going. Um, a few quick resources in addition to that working group to uh, put on your radars before we turn to questions. Uh, Women in Global Health has launched a campaign called Operation COVID 50-50, calling for parity in decision-making around this crisis, as Claire and others have alluded to, as a necessity. Uh, there's another group called Feminist Response to COVID-19, another communication and, and resource-sharing platform. And then Data2x, as well as the Center for Feminist Foreign Policy, are working to collate gender and feminist resources and share those. Um, do feel free in, in the different platforms we have, Twitter, YouTube, et cetera, to share other resources so that we can all be sort of stronger together on these various fronts. With that, thank you all speakers for incredibly insightful comments to kick us off. We're going to turn to the many questions that unfortunately won't, we won't be able to get through all of, but, but we'll do our best. Um, I'm going to start off with one that speaks to the social safety net angle. CGD, well before COVID, has heavily emphasized cash, cash transfers, unconditional and conditional, as tools for transformative change, at least among, you know, bundled suite of other interventions. Um, and Amber, I'm going to start with you to comment on, in response to COVID, how should we be thinking about the mobilization of cash into households and especially targeting in ways that can narrow gender gaps and benefit women and girls? Thanks. So as you said, social protection and cash transfers are a really critical response right now. And if people are kind of keeping tabs of what the World Bank is, is compiling, you would know that as of last Friday, 106 countries have kind of adapted 418 initiatives to kind of tackle this through social safety nets and social protection. So this is a, a bit of a difficult question in terms of the gender of the, the target recipient, because um, many of you may know that we don't have great evidence kind of even from the large body of development programs in terms of if you were to randomly assign a man versus a woman in the household, what would be the different effects? But my initial reaction would be to recommend that you kind of, you know, carry on as if um, you are delivering in a non-COVID situation. So 
obviously the first kind of response is to build the resilience of the, the existing benefits, the existing social protection programs, and make sure those benefits continue whether or not they're going to um, men in the household or women or whether or not they're individual benefits. So we definitely want to keep delivering the individual benefits. We don't want to take benefits away from women in particular. But more kind of at the household level, what I'd say is that research suggests that it is appropriate to target women and it can benefit women if they are the target recipients. But I think the devil here is in the details. So messaging around kind of household harmony, having multiple kind of backup recipients and multiple people in the household receiving information is really helpful. So um, trying to kind of give holistic benefits to the household right now is also very important. So I'm not sure if I completely answered the question, but those are kind of some top line thoughts. Thank you, Amber. We're also getting a lot of questions uh, to you, Gary, on some of the comments you made around toxic masculinity, but how COVID is shedding light on how positive masculinities can be promoted instead. Um, and in addition, whether this serves as grounds for the need for a global health strategy for men out of WHO or elsewhere. Yeah, thanks for that. And maybe I'll comment on the care work issue as well. I think, um, you know, we've, we and particularly uh, feminist voices in public health have long said how little public health has thought about gender for women. Um, men have often been the default for a lot of interventions in health, but without looking at men as gender beings or looking at kind of all men and all women as being somehow equal without the intersectional lens that I brought up before. It's clear what we know about men's early death rate and how most, the vast majority of that is preventable, or at least a big portion of it is preventable, um, that we do need a greater gender lens that looks at how masculinities and social determinants interact to produce poor health outcomes for men. I think the challenge has been how to do that in a way that doesn't feel and does not take away from the needed resources for women's health. Um, and so I think that's the challenge. How do we move beyond a zero sum game on this to say, we need this for the benefit of women and men to understand men's health risks. And that turns me to the issue of care work as well. I think as we've looked at the, the care burden that, that Claire spoke about, both in terms of who does the unpaid care work at home, as well as in caring the, the care professions, health and otherwise, the vast majority of that's done by women, the vast majority when it's paid is done by underpaid women. I think we often stop the sentence there and acknowledge that problem without saying, where is our imagination to believe that men and boys can do 50% of the care work? Where are the changes that we need in the social norms? Those are not unmutable. We know a lot about what policies can do that combine well, thoughtful social um, safety net programs that Amber talked about. We co-authored a paper that looked at how do we think about transforming masculinities within women-focused um, social safety nets? How do we do other policies that say we need men and boys doing half of this? I think a culture of care that thinks about masculinities has to be self-care, has to be a quality of care in the home, and has to think about how do we bring men into the caregiving professions so that men are also on the front line of that. Um, so I think I think it is possible, but I think we've got to push our imagination. I do hope that there's an opportunity in this crisis moment to say it's not okay that men aren't doing our share of care work at home. It's not okay that we as men don't feel implicated in supporting the situation of frontline care and health serving professionals. And it's not okay that men look, some of us, you know, that men would look from the sidelines and say, well, that's horrible that some men are using violence, but I don't and to say, how do we engage all men in that solution? Thanks. Thank you, Gary. Um, I'm gonna turn now to Buki, because we're also getting questions around some of your comments on gender-based violence, and especially how to ensure that more vulnerable populations are being uh, prioritized, especially those who may be in informal settlements or slums, right, who don't have access to the technologies, you know, the WhatsApp groups that you were referencing. How do we reach those that are hardest to reach in that context? Thanks. I mean, I think that's always a question that we've all, we all constantly think about and constantly finding ways around. And the ways we've only been able to do that or access that is 
for some of us who've been doing this work before um, COVID um, happened on the scene, um, it was working through community champions because we know that, you know, when you work in communities, you always have to find those who are able to influence, who are able to change understandings around negative gender norms, they'd be willing to talk about violence um, against women not being normal and needing to change that. And so what we realize is really about how do we continue to engage community champions? How do we continue to support them to be able to push out that information? We're still doing it with social distancing and still doing it um, in ways that ensures that they're protected and they don't do it in a way that doesn't make them. And the second thing is radio. That's one of the biggest thing, no matter where you go to in Nigeria, most parts of the rural communities, most communities, radio is a big thing. So how do we continue to leverage on radio as well to be able to pass on information, to be able to share information and doing it in a way of, you know, packaging it together with COVID, because we know that in these communities as well, there's a lot of distrust. There's a lot of not on, not getting what exactly um, is going on with COVID and how to their communities. So I think that's critical to package it together as well. So COVID, you're talking about the issues around it, the isolation that's going to happen, what that's going to mean for the communities and also addressing the issue of violence as well and bringing up that issue um, in particular and talking also about health, right, in general, because um, there are also different underlying health issues in those communities as well. And I think it's also important to talk about communities that we don't often think about, which are not just informal settlements, but thinking about sex workers, you know, I'm part of um, a group of people who um, do work around HIV as well. And we know that a lot of them are not going to be able to work during this time. Or, we, you know, women who use drugs, how do we make sure that they also continue to get information, they continue to get support, and they get, um, they get the information that they need also girls living with disabilities so we're constantly having to say that those who are already doing this work in which way what tools do they have what support do they need how do we as organizations come together to really leverage on each other's strength to make sure that we're providing the support each other needs to continue to do thank you buki so sorry if that just cut off a bit are you finished Yes, I'm done. Okay, good. So, so sorry. Um, connection just lagged a bit on my end. I want to keep going on this intersectionality piece that you just emphasized and has been sort of a thread throughout our conversation and turn to Carly. Uh, Carly, there's a question for you on pregnant women, uh, specifically women of color who are pregnant and how to make sure that we're thinking intersectionally about some of the guidance that that needs to be directed at those who are developing vaccines, those who are doing the broader clinical trials that you, you discussed? Sure, so I, I think um, there's two ways to take on this question. One is in terms of just access to, to routine care, and one is about uh, participation in, in trials. So I, I guess I'll take on the first one around access. Um, you know, there are, of course, going to be, as there always are, structural barriers for women, women of color, those who already have less access to health care um, outside the COVID experience, but then as different types of mitigation measures are put in place that may limit transport, that may limit um, access where people have lost jobs and lose their health insurance. Um, I think there are, there are so many different things that need to be put in place in different contexts to try and, and mitigate the harms um, and, and keep access available to pregnant women who are in desperate need of either routine uh, antenatal care as well as labor and delivery services. Um, and I think we're all kind of trying to struggle through figuring out what are the right solutions in the right context to reach those women who are already struggling with, with access in the best of times, let alone now. Um, there are a few things sort of generally that I would highlight for thinking about continuing routine maternal care services. Um, one is looking at innovative transport services that can go out and get those women, um, because we know that there have been huge disruptions uh, to the way that people travel, um, and particularly those who are not near clinical services. So if there are additional ways 
um, to be able to provide transport free of charge to women who need to access emergency obstetrical services or need to come in and deliver their babies in facilities so that they can have an attended birth. I think that's a critical point. Um, I think generally we need to make sure that um, maternal care services as well as other routine and, and chronic and or urgent uh, care services are maintained. Um, so while there is a huge push to direct a lot of providers to the growing COVID response, we need to remember that certainly those with um, obstetrical training um, need to actually be available to help with labor and deliveries. Um, there's also huge issues around blood supply. Um, we know that we're experiencing blood shortages, um, so people can donate certainly to try and increase that, but this poses an especial risk to people who uh, may suffer postpartum hemorrhage. And we also know that those who are at risk of that due to anemia beforehand are different based on both racial groups and structural uh, barriers to adequate nutrition. So those are just a few of the pieces, but again, this is a, a really complex challenge during a very complex time, and, and I certainly don't have the answers. Um, on the issue of, of enrollment in trials, you know, again, this is also uh, very tricky because there's very different baselines of trust of the medical research community among different cultural groups based on past experiences. So there I would say it's really going to be about um, going through um, channels that are already trusted, being really smart about communication so that that way people aren't afraid to enroll in something that might actually be beneficial to them. Um, but just also recognizing that, that, you know, of course there has to be voluntary consent to participate in any of these trials. And there may be communities that are just resistant to doing that. And that's not something we'll necessarily be able to solve in this crisis. That issue of trust, a really important one to, to continue to emphasize and foster. Uh, we are just at time, but Crystal and Claire, I do want to give you both the last word um, because both of you alluded to the opportunity for more systemic change if we do the right things in this moment. Um, any final thoughts or recommendations on that front before we wrap up? I can jump in unless Crystal wants to go first. Um, I think there's two things. I think one is let's not take a short term view on this. Right? I think it's really important that we think about the longer term gendered impacts of, of outbreaks. Uh, so, you know, of course, the priority right now has to be ending the epidemic and trying to get everyone's lives back to normal. But beyond that, we know, for example, from Ebola, that women return to work later than men after the crisis and the post-crisis period. We know that more women lost employment, right? We know, uh, and so when we imagine these trends are going to be the same in this outbreak. So what policies can governments uh, implement now uh, through economic stimulus or provision of, of financial support later on to ensure that the, the longer term effects which might disproportionately affect women and other marginalized groups can be preempted and mitigated against, right? We, we have the data for this, so it should be, um, you know, much easier than previous outbreaks, perhaps. Uh, and I think the other thing, just picking up something Gary said, um, is that maybe actually us all working at home, right, and kind of having that everyday experience and being able to zoom into everyone's, you know, living rooms, wherever they're talking for, is actually an opportunity to to recognize the domestic burden, right? And see it in it, get employers to see it, get whoever you're talking to to see it, and to realize that you know there is a domestic burden, whether that's a, a child running in, whether that's a cup of coffee cup sitting dirty on your behind, and you know I think that's really important. It's recognizing that people have other other stuff going on, and that we can you know talk about about changing perceptions and changing gender norms within that. Crystal, any final words to add there? Yeah, um, and I, as I see, I hear all these um, great recommendations and what we can do, um, but knowing what our governments on the continent have to face. I worry about financing and financing it in a sustainable way. Um, when we talk about free transport um, with a government that doesn't have a public transport system in the first place, what does that mean uh, practically on the ground, um, especially, you know, against the fact that the providers of transport services are 
private and SMEs, if you will. And so what does that mean in terms of economic stimulus for them? And how do you balance that with shrinking revenues for government at the same time? I think it's something that we really need to center. Um, in the in the financing angle, though, I think we need to remember that all financing has to have earmarked funds and budget lines for gender work, for supporting GBV, for supporting SRHR. And that means the right people need to be at the table. And so when we talk about parity in decision making, it's parity, yes, but the people that are sitting at the table need to have a strong feminist analysis for it to be to be impactful. And so it's not just a count of numbers and a disaggregation of who's sitting at the table. The right politics needs to sit at the table at the same time. Um, I think what this whole virus and the crisis that's come with it has brought to the fore is who really is holding up our economy. And I think going forward, we need to really rethink who we put importance on and who who needs who needs support in Kenya for example the doctors have been on strike you know years you know, a couple of years before this. And now we're seeing why they were going on strike. It wasn't just a question of going on strike because of lack of pay, but they were saying we are not trained for the type of medicine that we're, we're, we're practicing. And that it comes as a result of um, decreased public spending on public goods and services, like I've said before, and that really needs to shift. And this shift of perception, but also in terms of systemic financing, um, where we're, we're financing systems rather than vertical issues, I think will have to change. Um, you need to fund public access to water, you need to fund maternal care, you need to fund research, you need to fund, um, you know, all the different elements that go into life in general. And I think the perception of what life means is also going to have to really change and how we do things going forward. There's a new normal. Pandemics have been known to change drastically and dramatically in the way the world um, operates. And this is this is a, our chance to have a clean slate um, to rewrite what our future will hold for, for generations to come. Um, so yeah, I'll stop there and thank you very much. A good note to end on and also a healthy dose of pragmatism on the financing side. I need to understand what our baseline is across different country contexts in order to make sure change is, is more impactful. Thank you all um, for engaging, for sending your thoughts, your questions, for taking the time to listen in today. Thank you especially to our speakers who joined us from all over the world, from Seattle to London to Nairobi to Abuja to where I'm based with Gary and Carly here in DC. Um, really grateful for all of your insightful thoughts and comments. There have been a lot of questions requesting resources, so we will be sure to collate those.